In our neighborhood in Franklin Township, we have several neighbors who are Sikhs. You can easily pick them out because the men wear turbans and sport somewhat long hair and beards. According to their religion, Sikh men must wear five articles of faith that signify if they are fully committed to, to their religion. These include a small wooden comb known as a kanga, a small knife or ceremonial sword called kripan, slightly longer than normal underwear called kachera, a small steel bracelet known as kara, and they're not supposed to cut their hair or beard. The turban helps keep their long hair organized on their head, but it has also become the most visible symbol of their faith. But what happens if a sick man wants to join the U.S. military? Recently, the U.S. Marine Corps was asked to accommodate sick male soldiers. Last September, First Lieutenant Subhir Tour became the first Marine to be allowed to wear a turban as part of his Marine Corps uniform, with some exceptions. When Lieutenant Tour first joined the Marines, he said he was willing to cut his hair, shave his beard, and wear the traditional uniform. But when he was selected for promotion in the spring of 2021, he made a formal request to be able to wear symbols of his faith, including the turban, and grow out his beard. This was a critical test of what is essential for identifying oneself as a proud Marine as well as faithful member of one's religion. Finally, the Corps decided to relent on the issue of making every Marine dress in line with every other Marine. Some barriers in the Marine Corps standard had already been demolished when they allowed women to join the ranks. However, the top Marine brass didn't really relent totally, insisting that turbans would not be allowed for units that were ready to deploy at short notice, nor were sick Marines allowed to wear a turban or sport a beard when serving in any ceremonial position. Tour resisted these restrictions, however. In an article in the New York Times, he said, Look, I'm on the ground level with the trigger pullers every day. To them, I don't think it makes a difference. We have men, women, people of all races in my platoon. We all wear green, we all bleed red. My Marines didn't respect me because of what I had on my head. In today's study, we are going to see someone else making a case for intrusive standards before the top officials. The Apostle Paul is going to challenge the idea that some of the very conservative members of the church, the Judaizers who insisted that new believers become Jewish in their practice, including circumcision of the male practitioners, should be able to require Gentile believers to adhere to those same standards. In fact, from what we will be reading today, Paul brings along a living test case in the form of young Titus, a Gentile believer who has recently professed faith in Jesus. In the first chapter of Galatians, Paul made a 15-day visit to Jerusalem to confer with the apostle and church leader Peter and James, the brother of Jesus. In Galatians 2, Paul recounts another occasion where he visits the leaders of the Jerusalem church to discuss this issue. I'm reading beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. I went up according to a revelation and presented to them the gospel I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those recognized as leaders. I wanted to be sure I was not running and not, had not been running in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus in order to enslave us. But we did not give up and submit to these people for even a moment so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. Now, from those recognized as important, what they once were makes no difference to me, God does not show favoritism, they added nothing to me. On the contrary, they saw that I had been trusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter was for the circumcised, since the one at work in Peter for an apostleship to the circumcised was also at work in me for the Gentiles. When James, Cephas, and John, those recognized as pillars, acknowledged the grace that had been given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to me and Barnabas, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. 
They asked only that we would remember the poor, which I had made every effort to do. Let's continue now with prayer. Father, as we are looking at this study to, uh, together from Galatians, we are reminded how God looks at our heart rather than the uh, conditions that others may bring to us in order for us to be considered as followers of Christ. Lord, we pray that even today that we may be careful to only follow those, um, those procedures, those recommendations, those requirements that uh, Christ makes for us. And Lord, to be careful to be willing to share that good news with people of every stripe, of every background, so that they too can follow the Lord of love. These things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. In chapter 2 of Galatians, Paul moves the story ahead 14 years. We have to wonder, 14 years after what event? The first meeting he had with Peter and James, or after his conversion? Most scholars feel that the meeting he alludes to in chapter 2 is in regard to the Jerusalem Council, which is outlined in Acts 15. This is where the church leaders wrestled with the problem of bringing Gentile converts into the church. The issue was, did Gentile believers first have to follow all the Jewish laws and traditions, or could they become members of the Church of Jesus Christ on the basis of faith alone? During the Jerusalem Council in the book of Acts, Luke reported that after Paul shared with Peter all the things the Holy Spirit was doing among the Gentile believers in the churches he had planted, the gathered leaders determined that Gentile males did not have to be circumcised. But believers did have to abide by certain regulations of Jewish tradition. These included disavowing items that had been related to idol worship, refraining from sexual immorality, nor eating anything that had been strangled, including the blood of an animal. We're not absolutely certain this is the time when Paul and Barnabas made their trip to confer with the Jerusalem leaders, but this seems to be the most likely timeline. There are a couple of things we should note in these first two verses. In verse 1, Paul relates that besides Barnabas, their entourage included Titus. Titus was one of the Gentile converts Paul wanted the Jerusalem leaders to meet. In Titus 1 verse 4, Paul even referred to Titus as my true son in our common faith. Paul evidently wanted them to hear how God was working in the life of this young man, even without being circumcised or following the other Jewish traditions. The second thing we notice is that Paul's impetus for visiting Jerusalem was not just due to to the problem of the Judaizers harassing the Gentile converts. But Paul once again received a revelation from God urging him to go to Jerusalem. Paul took this revelation very seriously. God revealed his will to him through specific revelations and in this case, God prompted Paul that now was the time to make this journey to Jerusalem. In verses 3 through 5, we see another reason for Paul and Barnabas' visit to Jerusalem. The churches that Paul had planted were mainly filled with Gentiles. God was evidently moving greatly through these people in spite of the fact that they had little previous experience with Jewish customs and traditions. Yet into their midst came some people who did care about Jewish practice. Paul calls these Judaizers false brothers. In Acts 15, verse 1, these false brothers make a case before the Jerusalem leaders that these Gentile men should be circumcised. Some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. These men were hardcore in their belief that if you are going to be a true believer in the Christian faith, you must first follow the tradition that even Jesus followed when he appeared on the earth. This in spite of the fact that Jesus would eventually initiate a new set of religious principles for those who would follow him as Lord and Master. This was an issue which the early church had to determine. Must one first become Jewish before they could become a follower of Christ? One theologian has described the issue this way. The treatment of circumcision had become a test of the Christian faith. 
In historical terms, it must be decided whether Christianity is something other than a new Jewish sect. In theological terms, the decision is whether one's relationship with Christ is dependent on being under the law or the relationship to the law is dependent on being in Christ. In verse 5 of Galatians 2, we see Paul's response to the Judaizers. But we did not give up and submit to these people for even a moment, so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. This was Paul's heart. It's not about man's requirements. It's about submitting to Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. In verses 6 through 9, Paul gives his report of the outcome of the meeting with James, Peter, and John. They added nothing to me. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter was for the circumcised. Paul goes on to cite the originator and guarantor of both his work in the Gentiles and Peter's work to the Jews, God himself. The one at work in Peter was also at work in me. Their respective missions to people of different backgrounds were important to God's work among all people. This has continued to be important for those who seek to share the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. No matter who you are, no matter from what religious viewpoint or tradition your tribe originated, all can receive God's grace in their life through faith in Jesus. Paul recognized that the three men to whom he related at this Jerusalem meeting were considered by the church to be the pillars of the church, those whose leadership served to unify the church even as they witnessed to people of all cultures. We wonder about his observation concerning them in verse 6. The ones deemed important in the church, what they once were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. Do we notice a hint of sarcasm in his tone in this aside? These guys used to be favorable to this Judaizer crowd, but I don't care about that any longer. Or was he just noting that they all used to be sinners just like him, whom he characterized as the chief of sinners? It's difficult to decide, but the important thing is that they now were all brothers seeking the same Lord to lead them in their respective leadership roles. In verse 9b, Paul points out these leaders in the Jerusalem church extended the right hand of fellowship to me and Barnabas. Whereas the Judaizers had been trying to draw a wedge between the Jerusalem leadership and the Gentile churches he had planted, Paul expressed the idea that all was good between them. He goes on to further note that they came to an agreement on their mission to their respective fields, Paul and Barnabas to the Gentiles, and Peter and the rest of the Jews. Paul presents one more proscript to his meeting with the Jerusalem leaders in verse 10. They ask only that we'd, we would remember the poor. Bible scholars have detected that the poor was a code word for the poor believers in the Jerusalem church. Paul admits that he was already on board with their request. In fact, we see from various places in Paul's letters and in the book of Acts that Paul asked churches in his realm of influence to do that very thing collecting offerings for the Jerusalem saints. Paul mentioned these offerings in his letter to the Romans. Right now I am traveling to Jerusalem to serve the saints because Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. In his first letter to the church in Corinth, he wrote, Now about the collection for the saints, do the same as I instructed the Galatian churches. On the first day of the week, each of you is to set us something aside and save in keeping with how he is prospering so that no collection will need to be made when I come. When I arrive, I will send with letters those you recommend to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it is suitable for me to go as well, they will travel with me. As we can see from these letters, Paul's promise to the leaders in Jerusalem were not just empty promises. Paul made the collection and delivery of offerings to the poor church members in Jerusalem a priority. The idea that there is more than one way to handle church planning disputes is well represented in Paul's letters to the Galatians. He had a mission to plant churches in Gentile cultures, while Peter and the other Jerusalem leaders' strategy was to share the gospel with those from a Jewish background. 
They had different requirements for membership, but they still were one church focused on reaching the whole earth for God's glory. So what does Paul's recounting of how the first century, first century church resolved this conflict mean to us today in our own churches? Let me offer several principles. First, we must take care not to be distracted in our outreach program by those who demand certain qualifications before new believers are received into fellowship. Suppose, suppose God led us to evangelize someone who, has, who was habitually drunk or high or was sexually immoral. Many people would demand that before we let them join our church, they should demonstrate that they can keep themselves clean. But let me be clear. If we have had a genuine encounter with Jesus and accepted him as Lord, we don't first have to clean up our lives. We should allow the Holy Spirit to take all of our city dirty sins and help us to discard them as we learn to grow more and more in love with, with the Lord. Let us allow the Holy Spirit to put us through his holy ringer and clean us up in the image of true belief. Two, we should share the gospel with people to whom we have been led by God. This is a basic task of Christian evangelism. Once we are secure in our faith, let the Lord lead us to those who need to hear the good news of the gospel. Sinners have many more prospects for the gospel than do faithful church people. That's just the way it is, so let's be aware of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, prompting us to take this glorious gospel to God's prospects, just as we had ourselves been led to the gospel of faith. Three, we should listen to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in all our church matters. It's not just the early church that has problems with church fellowship matters. Today's church also has many people who would like to lead the church in certain matters they think are important. Let's only focus on people who are like us, others proclaim. No, we should take the gospel to people who aren't like us. Some insist we should celebrate the Lord's Supper every Sunday, but others say, no, once a quarter is enough. Only men who have been married to the same woman can be a deacon. No, even if a man was divorced before they became a believer, if they've stayed faithful to their current wife, then they are allowed to become a deacon. All these are matters with which the church has had to wrestle. But let us learn the lesson that Paul and Peter learned. God may want you to think in new ways about reaching the world for the gospel. 4. We should care for the poor in our community. This is a command that every believer should remember. There will always be the less fortunate in our community. Widows, families where the parents are unemployed or underemployed homeless individuals, people with high medical bills. Our church gives a percentage of all the tithes and offerings that people give every Sunday to the local ministries that reach those in the greatest need. We give to both the Hope House, which provides clothing and household goods at low cost to homeless and low income families, and Love in the Name of Christ. I volunteer every Friday morning at Love, Inc., which receives calls from people in need who have been referred by a church, a local agencies, or or some other organization. We help line up resources for those who call in, providing money for a family behind on their utility bill, working with one of our volunteer handymen to build ramps for seniors in, wheel, uh, in wheelchairs, and always offering prayer to the ones who call in. Love Inc. also works with individuals or families to learn how to budget the resources they do have. But each one of you may find other ways to help the poor and needy. Be careful, however. Don't just hand out money. Work with churches and agencies which have a track record of helping those in need without making the individuals dependent on handouts. We prefer to give them a hand up instead. Much of this study today may have seemed irrelevant to you, yet I hope I have pointed out some practical ways that you might respond. Are you regularly sharing the gospel with people without hope? Are you listening to the Holy Spirit as he leads you in making personal decisions? We certainly need that same wisdom as we make decisions as a church. Are you in tune with the needs of the poor and unfortunate in our community? May God make you sensitive to what he wants to teach you today.